Take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of Ezra. <clears throat> and you should have notes there. We're looking at Ezra chapter 6 this morning. Let me turn this thing on. We're getting a lot of wind noise this morning for some reason. I don't know if it's humidity or, or what. And uh, let me take a moment just to, to welcome uh, Brother Sam Pettit and his wife Jana with us this morning. And they've driven all the way down from uh, Knoxville, Tennessee today. So they have a little bit of a drive. And in the rain, that's not so good, but we're glad they got here safely. Looking forward to Brother Sam preaching for us tonight. All right, now then, <clears throat> if you look at Ezra chapter 6, we're going to look at just one verse, verse 22. And trying to uh, go through these uh, books of the restoration, that is Ezra, Nehemiah, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, looking at the back of the book, the end of the Old Testament, uh, the time of the restoration when Zerubbabel came back to build the temple and Ezra came back to build the people and Nehemiah came back to build the walls. And in verse 22 of Ezra 6, <clears throat> it says, in, kept, in fact, look at verse 21. And the children of Israel which were come again out of captivity and all such as had separated themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did eat and kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. For the Lord had made them joyful and had turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of the God, the God of Israel. Now this is really, this is after the temple had been built and restored and they had reinstituted the sacrificial system and here they are enjoying the feast of Passover. Now we've come sort of a long way now in our story. Uh, we're trying to f fill in some of the gaps here in just a moment, but I want you to look again at verse 22, the last part of our Coming in on this theme that is mentioned here, uh, they're rejoicing because um, that uh, God had turned the heart of the king of Assyria onto them. And I want us to think of that that uh, phrase that God had turned the king's heart. Now, what we find here in the time of the restoration, uh, what we've gained so far as we've we've looked at this story, is that when they came back and they came back because God had stirred their heart up. Uh, they had uh, really sacrificed themselves and their possessions to come back and rebuild the temple. Uh, but once they had laid the foundation, then they ran into the adversaries and there was problems, big problems. And they stirred up, uh, brought in counselors to frustrate them. They troubled them on every hand. And so the work of the temple ceased and it ceased for a period of 14 years. And uh, then their hearts really grew cold and and they were just thinking about themselves and they were building their own houses and that's where Haggai comes in and they, he says you know you're saying it's not it's not the Lord it's not the right time to build the Lord's house and he says well what about your houses that's okay for you I mean your houses are you've got uh, cedar sealed uh, houses and looking after uh, all of the luxuries of your own house and he says my house is land waste and God used the prophet Haggai and Zechariah to stir up their hearts to get back into the work of rebuilding the temple and uh, we said last time when God says, the, if you're standing on a brick wall and God says to move forward or jump, you know, forward, it's, it's our job to jump and it's God's job to move the wall. And that's what we find here. We find that if you go back to chapter 5 and verse 2, we see the response of Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua 2, the message of Haggai. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of uh, Josedach, and began to build the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. And with them were the prophets of God helping them. And so they began to uh, uh, really obey the, uh, God. But what about the adversaries? Well, they weren't going to stop. And what we're going to see here today is how God uh, used even the adversaries and the, 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 uh, the things that happened surrounding that to turn the, the king's heart uh, to, toward the people of God. Now, there's always people who will stand against God's people. If you look at your notes there, um, of course, Christians find themselves in the same hostile environment in this world that the Jews did of that day. And the kings of this world were not usually friends of God's people, and that's still true today. And from the time of Pharaoh, Israel suffered 
at the hands of Gentile kings. And you could go all the way through from uh, Pharaoh, and then even when they came into the land, and you had the, the Philistines harassed them, and the, <clears throat> the Moabites and the Ammonites, and all through Old Testament history. And uh, then you had the kings of Persia, which we're dealing with right now. Uh, of course, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, the reason they went into captivity was because of Nebuchadnezzar, um, that Gentile king of Babylon. Then the kings of Persia. Then you had the kings of Greece and uh, Alexander the Great and Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a great persecutor of the Jewish people. And then you had the emperors of Rome. Uh, you, had, uh, you had Herod. You had uh, uh, the uh, different... Uh, uh, you know, emperors like Vespian and Titus in 70 AD. You had Nero and all these, all these uh, kings, Gentile kings who have persecuted Israel and also, of course, the church as well. And so like Israel, we too can find ourselves in the wrong, the wrong end of government oppression. However, the lesson this morning will teach us a very important lesson. That is that God is bigger than any government and more powerful than any king. And so sometimes God, you know, um, hits these Gentile kings head on. He did that with Pharaoh. Look over at Exodus chapter 15. Exodus 15. Uh, when Moses crossed the Red Sea, it was a time when God had vanquished them of their enemies. God used the thing that they thought was going to kill them, the Red Sea, to actually save them. Uh, they went through in the night time. And then when the Pharaohs and his army came after him in the early hours of the morning, God closed the water in upon them. And as they stood upon the other side, we hear the song of, of Moses in chapter 15 of Exodus. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he hath thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Uh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he, hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains are also drowned in the Red Sea. And all the way through there, it's a, it's a song of triumph, that God is a man of war, and that God had defended his people. And of course, at the second coming of Christ, that's when really all of the Gentile kings uh, will be subdued, uh, and those who are uh, anti, the Antichrist and all those who follow him uh, will suffer severe judgment. And Jesus will come as the King of kings and Lord of lords. So sometimes God fights Gentile kings head on. Uh, but what we find in this scripture and others is that sometimes uh, God changes their heart from within. And of course, the key verse here, if you look at your notes there, Proverbs 21, verse 1. This is one we've heard uh, for a long time. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. And that's true not only of the king, but of all people. Uh, God is sovereign, and God can work in a man's heart to change somebody. Now, one of the kings that he changed was Nebuchadnezzar. Look over at Daniel chapter 4. And in, in some ways, um, God went to war with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, but uh, on, on a personal level. Uh, we remember in Daniel 4 the story how that Nebuchadnezzar was lifted up in pride. And at this point, he was a lost man. This was, he was an enemy of Judah and took them into captivity. And if you look at Daniel chapter 4 and verse 34 uh, through verse 37, uh, this is the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and mine understanding returned unto me. Now, the whole story is that when he lifted up in, himself in pride, that God abased him and basically robbed them of his sanity. And for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar uh, basically behaved like an animal. And his hair grew out, his nails grew out, he ate straw and, and, and grass. He just looked, And he slept outside, he basically lived with the animals. Um, but when he uh, somehow surrendered, when he lifted up his eyes unto heaven, when he yielded to the God of heaven, mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Now, this is, the, this is what Nebuchadnezzar is talking about. He's describing God here. Verse 36, At the same time my reason returned unto me, 
and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors, my Lord, sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellency, an excellent majesty was added unto me. But something had happened. God restored to him what he had lost because he had learned the lesson. But notice how he concludes that testimony in verse 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. And so certainly Nebuchadnezzar, I think the man got saved. I think his heart was changed. And, uh, of course, he learned it the hard way. But what we're going to see here is that um, uh, that God is able to reach into the heart of man uh, through various circumstances to change that man's heart. So let's go back to Ezra chapter 6. And we have three examples of this. First of all, King Darius uh, in Ezra chapter 6 and verse number 1. Now, I want you to look at the little chart on the bottom of, the, of your notes there because uh, it's quite a complicated uh, time because you're, you're covering uh, in these last days of the Old Testament, you're basically, uh, we go from the Babylonian captivity under Nebuchadnezzar and, of course, then there was uh, his grandson, Belshazzar, was the king in chapter 5. You saw the handwriting on the wall. And Darius the Mede and Cyrus the Persian, the, the media Persian Empire, uh, basically conquered Babylon. And so now you're, you're into the Persian Empire with the Persian kings. And that takes us all the way up really until the end of the Old Testament. And so that little diagram on the bottom, I know it's quite complicated. There's a lot of things in there. Uh, but I've, I've put some numbers there. One in red there is is the, the first decree of Cyrus in Ezra chapter 1 verse 1. So that is where Zerubbabel and the people get to go back to build the temple. So that's right at the very beginning. And God named Cyrus by name. Do you remember after the 70 years that the Persian king Cyrus would command and allow the, the Jewish people to return? Then under number 2 there, return to Palestine under Zerubbabel. And the temple building is begun. Now notice Zerubbabel... Uh, there's a period of 21 years there. They first come into the land. There's two years when they basically settle down and they're getting things ready. And then they start to build the temple. And then, of course, they're stopped. And for 14 years then, uh, the work ceased. And then when Haggai and Zechariah prophesied and Zerubbabel and Joshua began to work again, it was another five years. And after five years, the temple was completed. So there's a period of 21 years under Zerubbabel. But notice there's, 50, notice there's 58 years between Zerubbabel and Ezra. Okay? And uh, you're going to get you're going to run, run into Ezra uh, in chapter 7. So there's 58 years between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7. Um, and then at the end of uh, uh, when, when Ezra comes, that's number, uh, n- number 7 there, uh, the third decree under Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes was, uh, the, the return was for Ezra, and then, of course, Nehemiah. Uh, Artaxerxes was the king of Persia that uh, commanded the rebuilding of the walls, and that's when Nehemiah comes back. And so from Ezra to Nehemiah, there's 12 years. So it just gives you a general idea of the time frame that you're, that's involved here. And, of course, Cyrus was the first king, and then you have... Um, uh, there's Darius the first, which is going to be the king that's, that we're dealing with right now in chapter 6. Artaxerxes, the next king, is also called Asuras, and he's the king of Persia during the time of Esther. Okay, And then after Artaxerxes or Asuras comes Artaxerxes the first, and he's the one who uh, makes the command to rebuild the walls. So if you go to Ezra chapter 6 again, uh, in verse number 1, King Darius's heart was turned it says, Then Darius the king made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rules where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. Now, why did he do that? Because once in chapter 5, the prophets had spoken, and Zerubbabel and Joshua start building the house of God. Um, then in verse number 3, uh, at the same time, if you look there at Ezra 5, verse 3, at the same time came to them Tatnai, governor on this side of the river, and uh, Shethar Bosnai, and their companions, and said thus unto them, Who hath commanded you to build this house and make up this wall? Uh, they said, What are the names of the men? that?" And we're taking names here. Who's given you the authority to do this? 
So here comes the opposition again. Now they'd stopped because of opposition. The prophets prophesied, and the leaders are now getting back into it. And but here comes the opposition again. You know, sometimes we think well, if we obey the Lord, then everything's going to work out. Okay, well, sometimes you've got to persevere because the opposition is still there. But in verse 5 it says, But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, that they could not cause them to cease, till the matter came to Darius. Then they returned answer by letter concerning this matter. Verse 6 says, The copy of the letter that Tatnai, and Tatnai is the enemy, and he's writing, a gov- now he's writing over from, Jer- from Jerusalem over to uh, Persia, okay, and he's uh, he's going to uh, uh, write to Darius and and tell Darius these are troublemakers. Um, you've got to stop this, and so he's appealing to the king of Persia that this be stopped. And you can read the letter from verse six onwards. The problem is that they appealed to uh, to facts. Uh, in verse uh, eight, it says, "Be it known unto the king that we went unto the house, the province of Judea." to the house of the great God, which is built it with great stones, timber, is laid in the walls. And this work goeth fast on and prospereth in their hands. Then asked we those elders and said unto them, Thus, who commanded you to build this house and to make up these walls? We asked their names also to certify thee that we might write the names of the men that were chief, the ringleaders, if you like, verse 11. And thus they answered us, saying that the, the servants of the God of heaven and earth build the house that is built these many years ago, which a great king of Israel built it and set up. That would have been Solomon, of course. But after that, our fathers had provoked the God of heaven on the wrath. He gave them unto the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the Chaldean, who destroyed. It's interesting that people, when they give the report, they were, they were saying why they were uh, taken out of the land because of their sin and carried away the people to Babylon, verse 13. But in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Babylon, the same king, Cyrus made a decree to build this house of God. Now they, uh, the Jews appealed now to the facts. The facts were that Cyrus had made that decree. And the decree of the, uh, the, Pes- the Medes, the Persians and the Medes, the king's command could not be reversed. So if the king, Cyrus, says that you're to build a, a town, then no other king of Persia could reverse that. Um, and he also mentioned the vessels of gold. Now, that's, this is important because these things were expensive, and there would have been a, a log made of these. There would have been a record of these vessels being taken out of the uh, out of the treasury. Verse 14, the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple was that was in Jerusalem and brought them unto the temple of Babylon. Those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto the unto one whose name was Shazbazar, uh, whom he had made governor. Uh, now, if you come down to verse 17, they conclude this letter of complaint by saying, Now, therefore, if it seem good to the king, let there be a search made in the king's treasure house, which is, which is there at Babylon, whether, whether it be so. And, of course, they, they didn't believe it was so. And so they're appealing here, instead of uh, to emotional arguments or hearsay, they're saying, check it out. And the problem for them was that it was true and it was real. And so the uh, command to go back to build the house of God uh, was just and it was legal and it was approved by the king of Persia. So verse, when we get to chapter 6, verse 1, then Darius the king made a decree and search was made in the house of the rules where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at Akamatha in the palace that was in the province of the Medes, a rule, and therein was a record thus written in the first year. And here's the record. In the first year of Cyrus king, uh, the king, the same Cyrus, the king, made a, a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be built, uh, the place where they offered sacrifice, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof three cubits. Now, cubit is, uh, is 18 inches. So you've got three score at 60 cubits, so it's about 90 feet tall. And the breadth thereof, uh, the same, three score cubits, with three rows of great stones and a row of new timber, and let the expenses be given out of the king's house. Uh, and it goes on. Now, when you come down to verse 7, because of what Darius uncovered, then he writes back to these enemies. And here's what he says to them. Let the work of this house of God alone. He said, now the thing was, it wasn't that Darius was for the work of God to begin with. God used this occasion to turn his heart 
to be the friend of Israel and what, what they were doing uh, with the temple. He says, let the work alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house in his place. Moreover, I make a decree that ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God and that the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, uh, forthwith expenses be given unto these men that they be not hindered. He says, not only are you to leave them alone, but you're to help them and you're to pay them out of the tax money that's coming from Palestine or from basically from Israel. Um, that was would, the tribute money which would be going back to Persia. He says, you keep some of it there and give it to the Jewish people here um, doing this work. And he says, uh, that with expenses be given unto these men that they be not hindered and that which they have need of both young bullocks and rams and lambs for burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, oil, according uh, to the appointment of the priests which are Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail. I mean, can you imagine this letter coming to the adversaries, what this meant to them? It was, it was just tragedy for them, but it was brilliant for the Jewish people. It was what they were needed. Now, uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, they had already started on the work. They had jumped, and this is what we see now, is God is breaking the wall down, and God's making a way for them. Uh, down in verse 11, also I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, let timber be to, pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. And the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter and to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree, let it be done with speed. Unbelievable! The whole thing changed around. I mean, it was just com the tables were completely turned. And the adversaries were greatly disappointed. And Israel rejoiced. Any wonder they were rejoicing here in verse 22 of chapter 6? Because they were rejoicing because they, the God had turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. It's an absolutely amazing thing to see this happening. It's almost like just the sovereignty of God at work. And God placing those things together, whereby uh, uh, the the work was uh, the work was accomplished. So God was able to turn the king's heart, the king of Darius, the king Darius, uh, his heart was turned. Go back to chapter four. You may have noticed when we went through chapter four that we didn't go through chapter four. We basically went from verse one to verse five. We're talked about the opposition. And then we went to verse 24, then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. But in verse 6, it mentions Asheros. In verse 7, it mentions Artaxerxes. Now, the thing about it is, these two mentionings of these two kings are out of, out of order chrono chronologically. Okay? As you see on your map here, Artaxerxes or Asheros. And Artaxerxes the first didn't come until 50 years later. Okay, but when Ezra was writing this, he inserted these things in that happened later. In other words, when he's explaining the adversaries, verse one now, when the adversaries of Judah and and it wasn't just the adversaries during uh, uh, Zerubbabel's time; it was also adversaries during Ezra's time and also Nehemiah's time. There are always adversaries. There's still adversaries there today. And look at verse 6. He says, And in the reign of Asherus, now who is Asherus? That's the king of Persia who married Queen Esther. Now, when he married Esther, did he know that she was a Jew? Nope. Look at verse 6. It says, And in the reign of Asherus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. That's all it says concerning Asherus. In other words, um, we find that King Asherus was getting a, a bad press. He was getting negative information about the Jewish people from the people who lived there, the adversaries. And when Asherus got it, he, he uh, doesn't say his response to it, as it does with Artaxerxes here in a moment. Uh, but we see here that uh, certainly in the beginning of Asherus' reign, uh, he, was not, he, was, he would not have been uh, uh, amenable to the Jewish people. He wouldn't be sympathetic toward them. And we find that in the book of Esther as well. Uh, look over at Esther chapter chapter 10. We don't have time to go through the whole thing, obviously, but in Esther chapter 10, if you know the story of Esther, this is where it ends. Now, you've got to read the whole story because it was looking really bad. 
And of course, it talk, talks about the king Osterus and his his wife that was uh, you know disrespectful and so on. He goes looking for a new wife, and he finds that new wife in Esther. Uh, but Haman, you know, his hatred for Mordecai, the Jew, and all the Jewish people, he made this uh, got the king to, to sign this decree, which couldn't be changed. That on a certain day. Uh, all the, the enemies of the Jews could come in without any kind of uh, repercussions and basically slaughter all the Jewish people. And so, and you know the story how Esther then has the banquet for a, uh, uh, Haman, Haman and, and the, king, the king, and then she reveals how she's a Jew. And so her life is in danger. And then the king goes crazy. And that's when he turns, that's when God turned Asherah's heart toward the Jewish people. And by the time you're done, not only has he written another decree where the Jews can defend themselves, and that's where you get the Feast of Purim from, uh, but also he exalts the Jewish people and basically makes them the, the head rather than the tail. If you look at the last chapter in chapter 10, it says, And the king Asherus laid a tribute upon the land and upon the isles of the sea, and all the acts of his power and of his might and of the declaration of the greatness of Mordecai were unto the king uh, were unto the king advanced him. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was next unto the king Osiris. He was like like Joseph. He was second in command here. Uh, and great among the Jews and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his seed. Because of what happened with Osiris, his heart was turned and really the safety of the Jewish people uh, was was consolidated because of that change that took place uh, under King Osiris. And so God is able to change the king's heart. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it, turneth it whithersoever he will. Now look at Artaxerxes. Look at Ezra chapter 4 and verse 7. So after he talks about Osiris, and you look at all these guys, they, every single one of them, and the Jewish people were the underdogs. They didn't have the military strength to do this. They were completely dependent upon the sovereign God of Israel to fight for them. And it wasn't where God was fighting uh, these kings from without, but he was changing their hearts from within through circumstances, through the sovereignty of, of, of his will. In verse 7 it says, And in the days of Artaxerxes wrote Baislam, uh, Midradath, uh, Tabil, and the rest of their companions are on the Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the writing of the latter was written in the Syrian tongue and interpreted in the Syrian tongue. Rehum, the chancellor, and um, Shimshai, the, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, in this story. Then wrote Rehum, and the chancellor, uh, and Shamshai, the scribe, the rest of their companions. Let me see. Look down at verse, uh, verse 11. This is the copy of the letter that they sent unto him, even unto Artaxerxes the king. Thy servants, the men on this side of the river, and at such a time be it known unto the king that the Jews which came up from thee to us are come unto Jerusalem, building the rebellious and bad city. And that's not, he's not talking about the temple here. The temple's already built. The, the temple was built uh, under, finished under Darius I. Then you had the whole story with Esther take place. There's 50 something years. And now this Artaxerxes is the king of Nehemiah's time. And this is early on in his reign. And he got, gets all these bad letters from the governors there in, in, um, in, in Jerusalem. Um, down in verse uh, 13, Be it known unto the king that if this city be built and the wall set up again, then shall they not pay toll, tribute, and custom, and so thou shalt endamage the revenue of the king's um, and so it's, it's really very negative. But notice the response. Uh, let's see if I wrote this down here. Look at verse uh, 21. This is, now, this is the response of Artaxerxes. Uh, Give you now commandment to cause these men to cease. That's the end of the letter. Uh, verse 22. Take now that ye feel not to do this. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the kings? Now, when the copy of the king Artaxerxes' letter was read before uh, so basically, this is the uh, verse 17 to verse 22 is the response of Artaxerxes, and he said, "Cause this work to stop. Give commandment to these men to cease, and that the city be not built until another commandment shall be given from me." Well, there was another commandment, but what happened? So, in those early years of Artaxerxes' reign, he was anti-Semitic. He was 
against the Jewish people. He commanded the work to stop, and the adversaries are rubbing their hands again. See, it's going back and forth. They're against the Jews, and the king's against the Jews, and then God does something, and he turns the whole tables, and then the, the king is for the Jewish people. But when these different kings come in and, and things are forgotten... And these letters coming back from Jerusalem, this bad press that they're getting, affecting the hearts of these kings. Uh, but notice what happens. Look over at Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 1. And I want you to notice the time frame here. See, those letters went in the early days, in the days of Artaxerxes. But <clears throat> Nehemiah comes on the scene in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. So if you look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, the words of Nehemiah, the son of uh, Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, 20th year of the king's reign of Artaxerxes, as I was in Shushan the palace. See, Nehemiah, so it's kind of like God has his inside people. So with Asherah, who was his inside person? It was Esther. Now, did Esther know what she was doing at the, at the, when she went in to begin with? I mean, it wasn't really her choice. She was basically chosen out because of her beauty. It was the sovereignty of God was all over the thing. And she ha had come to the kingdom for such a time as this. As God sovereignly had put her in the right place at the right time. And Nehemiah is the same way. Nehemiah didn't apply for a job under King Artaxerxes, knowing that somehow that, that, that he was going to convince the king to send him back to Jerusalem. He didn't know that at the beginning. But God knew. And so God put the right man in the right place at the right time. And so Nehemiah gets this bad report, verse 2, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The adversaries were back at their work again. The wall of Jerusalem also was broken down. The gates thereof are burned with fire. Bad, bad report. Verse 4, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And God did something in his heart, just as he did with the people of Zerubbabel in the, in the early days when uh, Sarah said to go back and God stirred up their hearts to go back and to rebuild the temple and now God is working in Nehemiah's heart to stir him up to go because the, the, the city of not the temple but the city is laying waste the walls are broken down the gates are burned with fire and he fasts and he prays uh, look at verse 11 of chapter 1 here's his prayer O Lord I beseech thee let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper I pray thee thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of, of this man for I was the king's cupper and the king's cupper was a very trusted man in the, <clears throat> in the days of Pharaoh the king's cupper would, would have his cup in one hand and he would get the grapes in the other hand you see, if you get just if you just get wine and you put in a, somebody could slip poison into the wine. But you take the grape juice, the grapes, the actual grapes, and you take the grapes over the cup, and he squeezes the grapes, out, the grape juice out of the grapes into the cup. It's it's basically he's entrusted with that. So when the pharaoh gets the cup, he knows that the. By the way, what kind of wine would that be? On fermented, right? It's grape juice. Oh, it's got a wine. It's got a, you know, it's grape juice. Same thing here with Nehemiah. He's the king's cupper. He's a very tr entrusted person. Now look at chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan. Now this is really good. Because <clears throat> if you know Daniel, chapter 9, there's, a, there's a, a calendar of events given to the nation of Israel. Daniel's praying during the time of captivity. Where's it all going to end? What does the future hold? And God says, well, here's what, here's what the future holds. There's going to be a period of 70 weeks determined upon Israel and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem. And the weeks were weeks of years, 70 times 7 is 480 years. And he gives the beginning of this calendar events from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build, not the temple, but to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be three score and two weeks. Uh, so 69 of those weeks uh, until the Messiah would come. And then in verse 26, and he says, and the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. The point about it is this, that when the commandment started, it would be exactly uh, 483 Jewish calendar years until Messiah the Prince. So when did the command go forth? In the month of what? Nisan. 
What is that? March, April time. When is Passover? Nisan, the 14th of Nisan. Okay. When did Jesus come marching or riding on the donkey coming into Jerusalem to present himself? What month was it? The month of Nisan. It was five days before the Passover. See? So, it, so the timing is exact. It's not just the years, but the month is right, and actually the day would have been right as well. Anyway, the month of Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. So this is much later on in Artaxerxes' reign. Up to this point, Artaxerxes has basically been anti-Semitic. But now, uh, this man, Nehemiah, is, if you will, is being used of God to turn the man's heart. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, I had not been a four times sad in his presence, wherefore, but it was probably a dangerous thing to be sad in the king's presence. Wherefore, the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was sore afraid, because the king could have just lopped his head off right there. And he said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste? And the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. That would have been a quick prayer, wouldn't it? Inwardly, would have been saying, well, Hold on, King Artaxerxes, let me have a wee time of prayer here, you know. No, while he's still talking to the king, he's crying his heart, Lord, help me. In verse 5, And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall I journey be? And when wilt I return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I said him, a time it was twelve years. The king was letting, letting uh, Nehemiah go for twelve years. That was very generous, was it not? But the, I'm finished, but the point is this. God used Nehemiah to turn the king's heart. And here was a man who had listened to all the bad press and was anti-Semitic. But because of what happened here with Nehemiah, the, hearts, the heart of uh, Artaxerxes was changed. And now Nehemiah has been sent back with authority of the king of Persia to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And he did so. Now, the point is this, as we close. We, we must never forget that God is bigger than any problem we've got, that God is stronger than any enemy that we face, and the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He's able to change hearts and change situations. It doesn't matter how strong uh, that adversary might uh, seem to be to us. If you look at those last two verses there, and this is a verse we didn't uh, look at in Ezra 7, verse 27, uh, this is later on. It says, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem. This was <clears throat> Artaxerxes talking to uh, Ezra, which hath put such a thing in the in this as this in the king's heart. Ezra realized that this was of God, that God had impressed this man. You know, when God speaks to your heart, that heart can be absolutely reversed. It can be changed. Proverbs 20, verse 24, Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? In other words, God can rule and overrule in the affairs of men. Absolutely he can. And that's true in our time as much as it was in Nehemiah's time or in Ezra's time. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. I, I, you know, to be honest with you, um, I think, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not getting into politics or anything, but uh, when we think is what, what happened in the last election, I think God spurred us. I really do, because of what the direction the country was going in, and now that has been changed. Now, it's not perfect, uh, but at least you have a president who acknowledges Christianity and is somewhat sympathetic to Christianity and stands against Islam, okay? So I think that has been an answer to prayer. Um, and God, you know, God exalts one, puts down another. Um, promotion cometh from the Lord. So anyway, we're grateful for that. And whatever we face in the future, we know that God is able and that he can indeed change people's hearts and change situations. Father, we thank you for... Uh, your word, we're grateful for this example of how you changed three kings' hearts. The Lord, that your work might go forward and your love for Jerusalem and for the Jewish people. And we realize that one day that, <clears throat> that Jesus shall come and that, Lord, he will defeat all of the enemies of Israel. And we're, we're looking forward to that time. 
But Lord, we pray and ask that you'd help us to understand that even now uh, that we're in enemy territory and the kings of this earth are not sympathetic toward us or toward your people. And we ask and pray, Lord, that you will help us to realize that you will and do enter into the affairs of, of politics and of people and the affairs of men. And Lord, that you're able to change the king's heart. So Lord, may we understand that principle. May we trust that principle. May we look to thee. May we pray for those in leadership that we might indeed lead a quiet and peaceable life. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.